Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. Now, now today we're going to have another show about Buddhism. And over the years, we've had a lot of shows about Buddhism, which has a reputation for paradoxes that defy logic. And in particular, there is the Buddhist concept of non-duality, the realization that everything in the universe forms a single integrated gestalt. A Zen teacher has just written a book that untangles the mystery and attempts to explain non-duality in plain English. Our guest is Brad Warner, author of the new book, The Other Side of Nothing, The Zen Ethics of Time, Space, and Being. Brad is the author of numerous other titles, including Letters to a Dead Friend About Zen, Don't Be a Jerk, and Hardcore Zen. A Soto Zen teacher, he is also a punk bassist, a filmmaker, and a popular blogger who leads workshops and retreats around the world. In addition to his books, his writings appear in Lion's Roar, Tricycle, Buddha Dharma, and Alternative Press. He also hosts the Hardcore Zen podcast and talks about Zen almost every day on his YouTube channel. Well, hello, Brad, and welcome to The Pathway Show. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. I love the title of your book, and I wonder if you can decipher it for us, specifically, The Other Side of Nothing. What is meant by that? Well, it comes from a quote from a guy named Coben Chino, who was a Zen teacher who came to the United States in the 60s from Japan. And he was the teacher of my first teacher. I first learned about Zen from a guy named Tim McCarthy, who was a Zen teacher that I met when I was a student at Kent State University in Ohio in the early 80s. And Coben has this wonderful quote that, uh, gosh, I wish I could remember it. It's in the book. Uh, I can't remember the entire quote off the top of my head, but he talks about flipping to the other side of nothing where everything is waiting for you. And it's just, it's this nice paradoxical quote. And I had actually used the quote in an earlier book. I think it might be in Don't Be a Jerk or one of my earlier books. I forget which earlier book I'd used it in. But it just, it, it, I, you know, you asked me to decipher it for you and other people have asked me uh, too. And, and I, I have to admit, I'm not exactly sure what Coben meant when he said it, but I, I kind of have a feeling for what it means to me. And it's this sort of, you mentioned the paradoxical nature of, of Zen, and that's kind of part of the charm of, of Zen. If anybody knows anything about Zen, I think that the, the only thing a lot of people know about Zen is, the, is it's full of paradoxes, full of these statements that say one thing and then turn it around to say the opposite of, of you know whatever they've just said and the other side of nothing is like one of those and it, it sort of implies to me kind of what zen is all about it's about the other side of, of nothing um this uh, this idea of non-duality which is the oneness of everything in the universe and the idea of emptiness which is another idea which is big in zen which is uh which is largely misunderstood uh, that the the universe is emptiness. But you can, when we say emptiness in Zen, obviously there's something other than emptiness because we're all here and there's something other than emptiness. But we also say that uh, fundamentally uh, emptiness is the underlying substrata of all reality. So that's kind of what the other side of nothing means. Right, the other side right. is here. Here we are. So emptiness in, in, in the Buddhist uh, 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 psychology has to do with potentiality, right? I mean, it's not just n nothing. So it's kind of a paradox about the word nothing, whereas... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there is. I mean, there's different ways of interpreting emptiness. And, and it's, it's funny, every time I use, every time I try it out an explanation of emptiness uh, on, on the internet, somebody comes along and says I'm wrong. But of course, there's, there's dozens of different ways in Buddhism to interpret that. One of the ways is, one of the ways I always like is that the universe is so unlike any explanation you can give. The, the reality, and when I say the universe, I don't mean some mysterious aspect of the universe. I mean the, the, the universe right in front of us, right before our eyes, is so unlike 
anything we can conceive of it being like that that all explanations we have are kind of null and void at the end and so that's one way that the word emptiness is used so it's 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 that kind of emptiness so so any explanation you have you can't really rely on so so you can always think of any idea you have about reality as being fundamentally empty you know fundamentally empty of of any of any reality, although those those ideas you have about reality can be useful uh, to kind of get you around, but, but they're fundamentally not true. <laughs> I mentioned before we got on that the dog would probably bark when the delivery arrived, so that's my dog barking. Okay, that's fair enough. Barking. Well, there's a dog barking a koan you might know in, in Zen, so that maybe he's telling. Like, <laughs> no, I don't know that one. How does it go? Oh, it says, uh, does a dog have Buddha nature? And the answer is, Mu, which means emptiness, but apparently the original Chinese pronunciation of the the word for emptiness was wu, which kind of sounds like a dog barking. So I does see. a dog have the nature wu? Okay. So <laughs> well, okay. So what brought you to Buddhism? I mean, what? How did this happen? I mean, did you you didn't grow up in Japan or a Buddhist country. How did you, how did you come to it? Well, I had a weird upbringing. We, my dad got a job. Uh, he was working for Firestone but from around the time I was born. But when I was about seven years old, I think, he uh, took a position in Nairobi in Kenya. So we moved to Kenya. And I was, uh, Kenya has a big Indian population. Uh, if you look at the map, you'll see that it's right across the Indian Ocean from India. So there's a lot of Indians live there. And, and I got exposed to Indian religion. My dad had some Indian friends there. And I that, that must have planted a seed of fascination. So I was about 11 years old when we came back. And I really, really wanted to study about Indian religions. And when I got to, but there was nothing. I was, I, we lived in a small town in Ohio, other than those four years that we lived in Africa. And there was nothing I could find out about Indian religions until I went to college. And I found a course called Zen Buddhism uh, that was offered by Kent State University. This was the closest I could find to anything about Indian religion. And all I knew about Zen Buddhism was it was the Japanese version of an Indian religion. Right. And so I took the course and it really uh, blew my mind, as they say, you know, to use that old expression. But it really flipped my head around. I was, I was as the bio that you read at the beginning, I was the bass player for a punk rock band. And the reason I'd gotten into punk rock was because I was really obsessed with finding the truth. And at the time, the, the punk rock scene that uh, I was part of seemed to be really interested in getting at the truth of things. You know, they were, it was very sort of a politically motivated punk rock. You know, it wasn't this sort of, drink and and have fun with your friends punk rock it was the more serious version of punk rock so when i got when i first encountered zen it seemed to be uh i i always like to describe it as the most punk rock thing i'd ever discovered because it seemed to be taking the 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 questioning that i had encountered in the punk rock scene to its ultimate degree you know we weren't just questioning the government and society and our peers we were questioning ourselves and reality itself you know so i really wanted to know about this and so uh, this teacher tim mccarthy taught taught everybody taught me and everybody else in the class how to do zazen which is the meditation practice in in zen buddhism and i started doing that as a daily practice uh, ended up about 10 years later taking a job in japan as an english teacher which uh, when i was in japan i encountered a japanese buddhist priest named gudo nishijima who'd done a a big deal translation of a book called Shobo Genzo, which is one of the classics of Japanese literature, and started studying with him. And he was the guy who convinced me to ordain. Um, I mean, it's a long, long involved thing to talk about what ordination means in Zen Buddhism. It doesn't mean quite the same as it means in ordaining as a Catholic priest, but it's a, but it is a, it, it is a legitimate sort of ordination process. So I did that. Uh, ended up writing a book about it, ended up writing nine more books about it, and, and now uh, here I am. That's the short version. <clears throat> and so that's how you became a Soto Zen priest, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, what is the difference between there's two schools of Zen? Um, there's a yeah. lot of different sects of Buddhism in the world, but um, you know, in the Mahayana branch, which is uh, includes the most of what's in Japan and China and Tibet, um, you've got Zen, which was kind of a evolution of what was Chan in Chinese. But then you have the two schools of Zen, and I think it's very interesting to contrast them. There's Soto and there's Rinzai. And yeah. did they start out as competing with each other? It's hard to say. I mean, it's a very convoluted history. I mean, the 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 thing, Rinzai is probably more well known in the U.S. and and in Europe as well, and they're they're the ones who uh, study the koans. You know, the what is the sound of one hand clapping and that kind of thing, where you're given the the paradoxical question to concentrate on, and then you're supposed to have a, an awakening experience through concentrating on these questions, and that's not the form that I studied in. In, in the Soto Zen, um, they actually, in Soto, we actually do study some of those same stories that gave birth to the koan questions, but they're usually studied in the in the sense of just, you just study them the way you'd study um, any sort of philosophical text or something. You don't, you don't sit and concentrate them on them, trying to have an experience based on it. Right. Um, and then the idea of having an enlightenment experience is sort of, if it happens, it happens, you know, that sort of thing. You're not trying to, to push for that sort of thing. Um, and so that's the style that, that I studied in. And what we practice is called Shikantaza, which roughly translates to just sitting. So the idea is that when you do your seated meditation practice, you're trying to get into the pure experience of just sitting, which is easier said than done. You're, you're trying to sit with no purpose other than just sitting. I mean, you're, you're sitting in a very specific way. So you're not just sort of sitting back in an armchair or something, you know, you're taking this uh, very straight up seated meditation posture and holding it, holding still. Ziggy, shh, shh holding still for a long period of time and staring at a wall and and trying as best as you can to let go of any thoughts that that come to mind but you're you're doing it rather lightly and not attempting to make anything happen you know right. you're just trying to be the experience for what it is yeah. as it is which which i really like because I think if you want to see reality for what it is, then just sit with it, I think is a, is a good way to try to do that. It also, I think, psychologically is uh, <clears throat> maybe a little bit more palatable for most people. I remember I used to teach uh, Vipassana, which is a, a Buddhist form of meditation. And um, people would say, oh, I can't sit still or I can't stop thinking or you know, I'm no good at this because I can't stop thinking. And I'd say, no, no, you know, all you got to do is make a commitment to sit. Just make yeah. a commitment to sit for 20 minutes, set a timer and just sit. And what will happen is you'll want to meditate because there's nothing better to do. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so that's the way yeah. I used to teach it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, when I first came to it, I didn't really have much access to good material, like reading material, because I say it's small town Ohio in like the late 70s, early 80s. So I'm just looking at these kind of trashy books and magazines and things. So I expected big things out of meditation. And, and at first it was really just boring. But what I, I learned about it is the the boredom of meditation is is kind of what's good about it. Like you say, there's nothing else to do. So you just you have to meditate. And this is especially true if you go on a retreat where you're spo you're supposed to just sit there for days on end, you know, and just kind of just, you know, do nothing but but sitting. And this is really, it really gets interesting. The boredom actually becomes interesting after a while because you're not not putting anything in there. You know, you're not you're not trying to like I say, not trying to make anything happen or trying to have anything happen, just looking at your natural state. And your natural state, uh, if you haven't paid attention to it, and most of us 
haven't, you know, we're distracting ourselves all the time. When you actually start paying attention to what's going on in your body and mind, when you're not putting new information into it constantly as we, as we do, it's real interesting. You know, I, I feel like what we do all the time is almost like we're poking our brains, trying to make, you know, something come up. But when you stop doing that, and just let it go it, it's it's really interesting what's what's in there yeah it's um it's easy to let go but it's it, it's simple letting go is simple but it's not necessarily easy and mm. um, that's that we learn that when we start meditating one of the things i find interesting about zazen is the idea that you sit there with your eyes open uh, most yeah. forms of meditation don't do that they you, you basically have your eyes closed so, you know, explain why, why, what is that like and why is that a good thing? Well, you know, it isn't, I've only ever done it that way because Zazen was the first form of meditation I ever learned and I've never done anything else. At least I've, you know, occasionally attempted some things, one off, you know, tries. So that's all I ever knew. My teacher used to explain it this way. He would say, closing your eyes is kind of shutting out the outside world and getting into your inner world. But in Zazen, you're trying to find the balance where the external world is actually part of your practice. So you're not shutting out the external world and trying to get into the internal world. The external world and internal world, are, you're trying to find a, a balance between the two. But in the uh, Soto form, that's one thing that differentiates Soto and Rinzai style Zazen. Both styles, you are open opening your eyes when you're meditating but in the soto form you're facing a wall so you're you're trying usually to face a blank wall like a white wall or a brown you know wooden wall something that's uninteresting which is really useful because the you know it's it's almost like having your eyes closed anyway because you're just facing kind of something that's that doesn't you know doesn't move doesn't do anything in the Rinzai style, you're you're actually facing each other. You're you're seated at the outside of the room, and everybody's facing in toward the middle. So you end up kind of looking at the other people who are meditating. And I've only done that a few times, and there is a, a sense. I I always end up looking at the floor in those cases because I don't want to look at the other people. But it can get it can feel a little bit uh, weird because you're looking at at everybody else in the room. So I don't know too much about that. <clears throat> What would you the, say, that's the idea of the external world. What would you say is the purpose of meditation? Well, it, it, Zen is funny because it's supposed to be, Zazen is supposed to be a goalless practice. So you'd say there is no purpose. Um, Kodo Sawaki, who was my Japanese teacher's uh, mentor and teacher, uh, said Zazen is good for nothing. So he would say it's, you know, there is there is no purpose. On the other hand, having said that, uh, nobody goes into it for no reason at all. You know, I I got into it because I wanted to find out the meaning of life. You know, that was my you know my big goal when I when I started out. And as I got more into it, I also found that it was extremely useful in in navigating well you know I, I was about 18 or 19 I think when I started I was uh, pretty young and I was having all those sort of adolescent noise and and stuff one goes through uh, you know at that age and it was really useful in kind of helping settle all that stuff out so so there is a there is a kind of purpose to it I think one of the reasons that Zen promotes itself as goalless, though, or with no purpose, is that often if you are expecting something to happen, that expectation can get in the way of noticing what is happening at this moment. So we try to set aside any expectations or any purposes we have for the practice while acknowledging at the same time that, like I said, nobody gets into it for no reason at all. You know, the things do happen and, and they do, um, it, it does do, it does have some benefits. Uh, the, the other problem also with expecting too much is, is sometimes people expect benefits and then things don't quite come out as beneficial as they they hope, you know. Right. It, sometimes, sometimes you become aware of your own 
difficulties. Uh, a lot of what comes up when you're just kind of open your mind up and just let things come up is a lot of your dark, darker aspects will start to reveal themselves and people get a little disconcerted with that. Uh, that's where it can help to have a teacher to talk to about those kind of things. Right. You know, your book is so philosophical and there's so much that we could talk about. You know, it's got a, a whole thing about ethics. The book is about ethics. How do you know if you don't believe in absolute morality, how do you, uh, or the Ten Commandments or whatever, how do you know, it, how can you be ethical without having this superstructure of black and white uh, belief systems ruling everything? And so, I mean, the whole book is about that, but what would you have, what would, what could you say something? Um, yeah, it's a hard question to answer quickly. It's, it's sort of an intuitive understanding that develops hopefully as you, as you go along the, the, in theory, I, I think in fact, actually, I, I say in theory, because I know people are kind of resistant to it, but I, I believe it's an absolute fact is that you, we all have an understanding, an ethical sort of understanding built into us. I, I, I really believe that. And I think some of us are very good at pushing that down. And one of the effects that meditation does is allows you to become more aware of that because is, as you quiet down that becomes it becomes easier to kind of hear in, in quotes you know metaphorically to hear your own sort of little voice of conscious your own little jiminy cricket or whatever it is you know you start to be able to hear that a little bit more clearly and that becomes your ethical guide and there are the, the the in the book i spend a lot of time going over the buddhist precepts which are quite similar to the Ten Commandments. I, I've forgotten now, I, I kind of mapped them onto the Ten Commandments it's, it, it, and there are 10 Buddhist precepts and 10 commandments. And I think maybe six of them are the same or, or similar enough that you can kind of coordinate them with each other. So, so it's a kind of a similar ethical system. But in the Buddhist precepts, you you don't have this idea of an almighty God who, who decided these things and will punish you if you don't do them. You know, you have you have this idea that they're they're given they're more than suggestions, but there's this idea that if you want to have a better life, you'll follow these precepts. But there's also the understanding that the precepts are guidelines in the sense that these are the things that work most of the time, but there will always be instances in which following the letter of the precept is not the way to keep the precept. Right. You know, those are rare instances, you know, the precept of do not kill is probably the best one. There's there's very few instances where killing would be the right thing to do. But occasionally those come up, you know, and right. you'd have to kind of do those on your own. But, you know, there 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 might be instances where where breaking the precept is actually the, the right thing to do. But, you know, most of the time you're, you're better off following the precepts, if, especially if you're not quite sure. You have a couple chapters entitled, What Am I Doing Here? And this kind of brings us back to Ramana Maharshi's question, who am I? You know, which yeah. was sadhana to keep asking, who am I? Who am I? And trying to peel that back. And, um, you know, I just think it's so paradoxical to think, well, I am not this, I am not that. You know, who am I? What are we doing here? And there's a quote in your book that I found amazing. It goes, our non-understanding of how things really are is a part and parcel of our bodies and our minds. In the case of the Buddha, he talked about how the, quote, temptations of Mara, unquote, stayed with him his entire life. Even after his great awakening, he still felt selfish desires. Wow. Yeah. I never I never read that anywhere. That's amazing. Um, yeah. That was an interesting little, I, I came across that idea in a, a, a book called Gotama Buddha, which was, um, I think, uh, Hajime Nakamura, probably doesn't matter. But it was a, a, a Japanese historian of Buddhism, 
who pointed out that the normal way we end, we hear the story of Buddha is he it's very similar to the biblical story of uh, Christ's temptation in the in the desert. In fact, they may have influenced each other. I don't know, but uh, Buddha gets tempted by Mara, who's kind of a Satan figure, and uh, you know with all these rewards, if he gives up his quest for enlightenment, and then right. Mara vanquishes or Buddha vanquishes Mara, and Mara goes away. And Nakamura did some research and found out that earlier iterations of the story of Buddha don't go like that. That's actually a later version. And that earlier iterations of Buddha's story have Buddha facing down Mara all the way up until the end of his life. He he, he talks about uh, temptations of Mara up until he's a very old man. And uh, and so he he wasn't he didn't have this one moment where he suddenly became free of it. That was kind of a, a little gloss on the legend that they, they put in there. So I, I think I, I prefer that version of the story, you know, that, yeah. that he, he was always stuck with this because he was a person, you know, and that it just, it just happens. And that, and that we all just have to, to deal with this. And, 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 and I like that better because, you know, that's kind of what I'm stuck with. And I think we're all stuck with that. And that you just gotta, you just have to deal with it. And when those those things come up, you just go, okay, there, there it is coming up again. And then you have to make the the choice to not uh, follow it. You no, know? no, it's, it's. I think it's a very, very good uh, point of view. Rather than this all or nothing perfectionistic uh, fantasies that we can have about perfect living masters and spiritual teachers, etc. And I love the way that you, towards the end of the book, you, you, I'm going to quote you here. I think that maybe human beings are a very important part of what the universal mind is trying to do. I suspect that we are a kind of project that the universe is working on. This is a big change for me. For a lot of my life, I thought that human beings were nature's greatest mistake. I love that. You know, I think a lot of us have, have struggled with this idea of how screwed up humanity is and how we're really messing things up. And um, I love that you can maintain a positive attitude. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a little bit, it's, it's tough. It, it's, it was a long process to kind of get there. My teacher, uh, the, the ordaining teacher, uh, Nishijima Roshi was a Japanese guy and he was in his 80s when I met him and he had survived World War II in Japan and he'd even been conscripted into the Japanese army back then you know unfortunately uh, fortunately for him he didn't see any fighting they threw him they sent him to some remote outpost where nothing happened but when he came back the country was basically gone but he had this great optimistic attitude and I thought if he can do that you know that's yeah. reason for me to be optimistic. Yeah, no, it's, that's beautiful. Hey, listen, we could go on. There's so much to talk about, but we've run out of time. And I want to be sure to tell our listeners about your website so they can go and learn more about your book and about your other books and about your work in general. And that is www.hardcorezen.info. Hardcorezen, all one word, dot info. And I want to thank you so much for being on the show, Brad. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. And for those who may have tuned in to Pathways Late, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. Now, don't worry, you can play or share this interview whenever you want via the internet or as a free podcast, and I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Brad Warner, author of the Other Side of Nothing, The Zen Ethics of Time, Space, and Being. And we barely scratched the surface today. It's an incredibly deep book. Um, it's very stimulating. And I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways today, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every Sunday morning at 8.30 USA Pacific Time. And even better podcasts, of today's show, which you can listen to, are available for free at divination.com, that's spelled D-I-V-I nation.com, as well as via iTunes, Apollo's YouTube channel, and other free podcast servers. Well, this is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And
Well, thanks again to Brad Warner and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.